This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. I speak with author Ethan Shiner, whose book Freedom to Win describes the gripping story of a group of small-town young men who would lead their underdog hockey team from Czechoslovakia against the Soviet Union, the juggernaut in their sport. In 1968, Czechoslovakia is experiencing the Prague Spring, an attempt to moderate and soften communism. However, a sudden invasion by half a million Warsaw Pact soldiers halt the reforms. We hear the inspiring story of how the young players of the national hockey team battled the Soviets on the ice to keep their people's quest for freedom alive and forge a way to fight back against the authoritarian forces that sought to crush them. You can buy a copy of Freedom to Win via the links in the episode notes and help support the podcast. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hello, I'm Craig Donald from Aberdeen and I support Cold War Conversations with a monthly donation because it marries interesting historical content with fantastic storytelling. Cold War Conversations is part of my weekly routine and I would urge you to make it part of yours. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a monthly donation is not your cup of tea, you can leave a one-off donation at coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Ethan Shiner to our Cold War conversation. This is a cracking story. And one of the things I really like about how you've done this is you've centered it on a family and allowed that to sort of tell the story and then sort of branch out from those characters. So can you just tell me about the Holik family and who they are and what their experiences are in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Yeah, the, the, the whole Leak family, what, a, what an interesting group. I mean, this is talk about driven people. So whole Leak, which is spelled H-O-L-I-K for people who, who may want to Google it at some point. Uh, the father in the family was, uh, was decided to become a butcher. And he decided to open a butcher shop in the middle of the Nazi occupation in 1942, which was you know, obviously terrifying. Um, but he managed to pull it together, managed to have this very successful butcher shop. And then sure enough, uh, once the communists took power, um, you know, after a couple of years, he found suddenly his butcher shop was nationalized and it wasn't his anymore. And this is a man who had grown up on on just incredibly hard work, and that's what he ins- tried to instill in his kids. And once he saw that the kids, you know, there was no point to having the kids come to work with him anymore, he decided to make his children athletes. He looked around at communist society and said, the way to succeed if you aren't a member of the Communist Party, and he wasn't going to become a member, was to create athletes. And he uh, decided that he was going to put his all into these hardworking kids of his and make them hockey stars. And so he had two kids, one, uh, his older son, Yaroslav, uh, who was one of the greatest characters I've ever heard of. I mean, he was just a complete wild kid and then a wild man who fought anybody over anything but he was this hard worker also who was determined to lift his teammates to glory no matter what, even no, no matter how much he was going to scream or fight with them. Um, the younger son was Yuji, who uh, was completely unlike the older bo- brother Yaroslav. Yuji was this uh, calm, happy, smiling young man who also happened to be one of the greatest, fastest skaters in the world. And the two of them uh, were these hardworking hockey players who took Czechoslovakia by storm and became international hockey stars. And at this time, I mean, 
Czechoslovakia had an iconic athlete in Emil Zatopek. Exactly right. And Emil Zatopek uh, was famous for all sorts of things in Czechoslovakia. He was famous for being a strong supporter of the communist regime, but he was most of all the most popular athlete in the country. He was he was actually one of the most popular athletes in the world. He was, it, it, according to some people still, he is the greatest runner of all time. And uh, my favorite story about him is he had already been wildly successful in the 1948 Olympics. Um, but right before the 1952 Olympics, a friend of his had qualified for Czechoslovakia's national uh, running team to go to the 1952 Olympics. But uh, this other this friend's father was a political dissident in prison. And so the government wasn't going to let this young man go and run. And Zadupak was also fiercely independent and said, this is incredibly unfair and I'm not going to go if my friend can't go. Well, the government blinked and allowed both the other athlete and Zadupak to go. Uh, well, there's all this pressure on Zadupak at this moment for, you know, the government may come down on him pretty hard if he doesn't succeed wildly. Fortunately, he had planned very well for this and went off to the 1952 Olympics where he was a middle distance runner ordinarily. He ran the 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters. He was clearly the best in the world at these events. And he won gold medals in both of them in Olympic record time. But what was really extraordinary was for kicks, he had never done this before. He decided to run the marathon as well and proceeded to set the Olympic record and won the gold medal in that. So far from being punished for standing up against the regime, uh, when he returned, the, the government you know, threw parades for him and continued to hold him up. And so Zadupek was this big hero. And the whole leaks looked at Zadupak and saw, you know, if 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 you can succeed at this incredibly high level, you can in, in athletics, the government is likely also to promote you and give you a better life in this communist society. So as far as the, the two boys in the uh, the whole league family, they start off with not really much. I mean, there's no equipment. There's nobody training them. I don't think they've even got a rink to uh, train on. And this is one of the things that's really wonderful about the whole leaks. And also they had a best friend from their town uh, who was exactly the same age as Yiji, the, the younger uh, brother, uh, a young boy by the name of Yan Suki, who would end up being one of the important characters in the story as well. The three of them grew up in this little town um, after World War II, the town was 10 to 15,000 people. They did have an ice rink, but the, what the ice rink was, it was a concrete slab that when it would get cold enough, they would go pour water onto it and, if, and then it would freeze for as long as it was cold enough. But that was about it. Uh, the equipment they put together, they would have uh, their mothers sew things together. They would uh, uh, grab pieces of plywood wherever they could. They, they were just incredibly... Um, they're ingenious in the way they put together uh, all the different types of equipment. And they were, you know, what they were referred to as sort of country bumpkins. Um, but it happened to be that they played a lot of hockey. They played together constantly. It was really only a very a small group of about 10 boys. And it seems that by them constantly playing together, and it's essentially getting no rest because there was such a small number of them. They really got incredibly good and they were able to really take on the, the big teams, the pro, you know, the people from Prague and the people from Brno, the second largest city in Czechoslovakia at the time. They were ultimately able to challenge the big city kids and really become stars around the country. But it was really they they had very little. It was kind of the classic story of the small town boys making there's so many things that make this a great story, but I think it's this like it's not quite rags to riches, but it is from hardly anything to becoming mega stars in Czechoslovakia. That's right, and you know within Czechoslovakia, you know it, it, it's an incredible story unto itself of this these small town boys. You know it, we we hear these stories, you know every now and then for you know, just about every country where it's the it's the underdogs from the smaller areas, but. What's incredible in this one is the underdogs from the small little area 
then become the stars of the under underdog country that can then competes against the behemoths of the hockey world and are able to really hold their own. That it really takes it to another level. I mean, one one of the little details that I I love in this book, and that there, there are so many, but the fact that there were these army teams in. Czechoslovakia, and I was familiar with them through football because there was Dukla Prague and right. various other ones, and they're all named Dukla after, I think there was a famous battle at the Dukla Pass. Exactly, during World War II. But they would sort of recruit good players to their teams. Well, everybody in Czechoslovakia had to serve in the army, so everybody was conscripted of, of a certain age. That's right. What they would do is pick out the best players for each sport and try and put them in army teams. And although they allegedly had to be amateur, they were effectively being paid by the army to play. The first uh, team to do this was the team in Brno that was representing the Ministry of Interior. And so they would bring these boys in to uh, supposedly be border guards, even though they were you know, countless miles away from any sort of border. And as a result, the Brno team was able to become this superpower. But the uh, boys I was talking about, uh, the Holiks, Yaroslav and Yuji Holik and Jan Suki, um, they all joined the army team, the Dukla Yichlava. So Yichlava being uh, the name of the town where the army team was. And that's J-I-H-L-A-V-E for people who want to look it up. And so they all went over thinking, you know, they were from this little town. And so they figured they would go over to this army team and just stay for a couple years and become stronger players and move on to more well-known teams. Well, they happened to be so successful that they made the army team a great team and they decided to stay with it. But this is actually, in Czechoslovakia, this was really different from what was going on in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, uh, the army team was incredible constantly. And people, it was, it was, Taken for granted in some in later years, actually, the government and the coaches made sure people stayed with the army team for their lives, for their entire lives. Whereas in Czechoslovakia, most of the good players who would arrive would only come and serve their two years for the army team and then go off to some other team, their hometown team or their preferred team. So there wasn't quite the continuity that you saw in the Soviet teams. And it's not surprising, therefore, that the Soviet teams were so good with all the continuity of the players on their army team. But yes, Yaroslav and Yiji and Jan Suki and a few other guys made up the core of Czechoslovakia's Dukla Yichlava, which was the army team. And they made it the best team in the country. They start to get noticed for the, the Czechoslovak international team. Again, these these three were superstars at a very young age, but they were relatively unknown at the time. Um, Yaroslav, the older brother, had gotten hurt, and so he had very seriously hurt. And so there was some concern that he might not be able to play hockey anymore. In fact, he might not even be able to walk anymore. And so what was kind of a, a cute slash um, sad story in a way, um, the father, the whole leak father, actually sent Yiji over saying Yiji had plans to go to play for the Prague team and go and make his fame and fortune or not so much fortune in, in communist society, but make his make his fame off in Prague. Um, but once Yaroslav was seriously injured, then Yiji was sent by the father to go be with his brother and join the army team. And Yansuki followed suit. Well, these guys are really young at this time. I mean, Yaroslav is just 21 years old and Suki and Yiji are just 19. But Yiji is so good. He's such a spectacular skater that at 19 years old, he finds himself on the national team. He is about to go off to play in the Olympics as a 19 year old for this, you know, with all his heroes on the national team. And Czechoslovakia was quite good at hockey at this point. For, in, this is 1963, 1964. But yes, Yiji get, goes off to America, and the first time he sets foot in New York City, he just can't believe it. He can't believe all the neon lights and all the signs, and especially what always struck the guys coming from Czechoslovakia was all the, the items in the stores that just seemed impossible to them that there would be all that. And so Yiji was really struck by his initial trips to the United States, absolutely. 
So uh, it's just sort of fast forward a bit. And as we're approaching sort of like 65, 67, what is the sort of boy's status in Czechoslovakia at that point? In 1965, 1966, they be- start becoming absolute heroes throughout the country. And in, in sort of a fun way too, and also uh, villains in a sense, because as they start getting better and better, you know, there's this, there was this incredible league around the country where there's this, in, this wonderful slash terrifying competition between the different towns and cities. So there would be some of the places that the players would go and um, they would find a knife being thrown onto the ice, threatening them or crowds spitting on them and pouring beer all over them. Well, the crowds only did this, though, for the greatest opposing players. It was the people that they most uh, loved despising. And Yaroslav Holik, by 1967, was the single person that all other cities loved to hate. Yaroslav Holik was this, as I said before, he was this incredible figure. And he would go out onto the ice cursing the crowd and the c- crowd would be cursing him back and Yaroslav Holik would take off one of his gloves and hold up five fingers to show, we're going to score five goals on you, which is a lot in hockey. And then he'd start to go into the locker room and he'd come back to the ice and take off his other glove and show his 10 fingers to show that we're going to score 10 goals on you and the whole crowd is screaming, we hate you, you're the worst. But they were doing this because he was becoming a superhero in that country and his brother was becoming a superstar. And if anything, Jan Suki, the the, the two Holik brothers who were forwards and focused on scoring, um, Jan Suki was a defenseman who also could score. He could do anything on the ice and um, so the three of them had become these incredible stars all throughout the country. And people, when they would come to play against their local team, people would curse them. But they also, all three men were also on the national team, starting with the 1965 World Championships. And the entire country, in those moments when they were playing for the national team, would love these young men. Would They would, they would become the heroes to everybody. And so by 1967... The Czechoslovakia team, which had been set back um, in the 1950s, now had become one of the world's uh, most successful ice hockey teams again. Yeah, I I love you. You describe um, Yaroslav as looking a bit like Liam Neeson. He does or did. Yes. And, And when you describe him like that, I can almost imagine him on the ice facing down those opposing fans saying, I'm going to hunt you down. <laughs> yes, yes, that's perfect. That is so perfect. I, I This is one of these cases where um, I, it would be nice if, well, when I think, when I imagine the, the quote unquote movie, I, I imagine Liam Neeson playing uh, Yaroslav in his later years. Unfortunately, uh, we would need a sort of a lookalike for the younger years to play him. But yes, hunting, hunting down the fans would be perfect. But even more likely that would, uh, Yaroslav, as I'm sure we'll get to, uh, most of all, hated the Soviet players. And yes, it's easy as most of all imagining Liam Neeson telling the Soviet players that he was going to hunt them down. And that neatly brings us to 1967. Now, at, at this point, the, the Soviets have been dominating ice hockey for, for some time. They're the dominant force. The story actually goes back a little ways, where in the late 1940s, especially once the coup had been carried out and the communists came into power in Czechoslovakia, the Czech- the top Czechoslovak players were sent to the Soviet Union to help train the Soviet players. And the Soviets had only introduced uh, the, the kind of hockey we're used to in today's world, what we call Canadian-style hockey. They had only introduced that in the late 1940s in the Soviet Union. So the Czechoslovak players came over and helped train the Soviets, and the Soviets were getting pretty good pretty quickly. In 1950, leading into 1950, the defending world champion in ice hockey was Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was so good, despite the fact that it lost a number of its best players in a plane crash. I mean, this is, again, this this story is, this, this big story is filled with all these stunning little stories, including the death of half the team in a plane crash. 
But in 1950, the defending world champion Czechoslovak hockey players went to the airport to go get on a plane to defend their title. And they suddenly were told they couldn't go. And a few of them went to a pub and they got into a fight in the pub. And next thing you know, the entire team gets hauled in, is arrested, and they are all imprisoned. Or, or I should say all but a few players are imprisoned, including the most serious case of somebody. Uh, two players were sentenced to 15 years in the uranium mines. So obviously with something like this, uh, Czechoslovakia's hockey team gets set back substantially. And it took quite some time for them to get back to their former prowess. Now, as, as, they are, as they fell back, the Soviets jumped way ahead and became the great, quote unquote, amateur hockey team in the world. I mean, certainly we can say they were the great national hockey team in the world. And in 1963, they start, the Soviets started a level of dominance that was sort of unimaginable. They, they were seen, they were referred to sometimes as the robots. Uh, but they also were frequently referred to as the red machine. They were they were just stunning. And so 63, 64, 65, 66, they won gold medals in all the world championships. During this time, Czechoslovakia was getting much better at ice hockey again. And 1967 was the year they really seemed to put it together. And they seemed to be possibly ready to challenge the Soviets at the 1967 world championships. A question I guess I've got to ask here is, where, where's the U.S. and Canada in this period? <laughs> what, are, what are they doing? The United States was typically irrelevant in international hockey throughout this period. The, the major exception being in, you know, people talk about 1980 as the miracle on ice where the United States stunningly defeated. It, you know, the, it, it, it is not an exaggeration to say the American team was a group of college kids in 1980 taking on an incredible Soviet team in the 1980 ice hockey in the Olympics and the Americans winning in 80. Well, there's a previous miracle, though, which is the United States had won the gold medal in the 1960 Olympics as well. Aside from that, the United States was essentially irrelevant in international hockey. Canada, for the most part, uh, was not putting forward its best players. Canada's players were either amateurs or minor league hockey player. So it wasn't the best players from Canada. And so Canada did fairly well in international ice hockey competition, but not spectacularly. So Canada was typically a good chunk behind uh, certainly the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia and, and typically Sweden as well. I guess the uh, limitation on amateur status what people allowed was you could be a, a hockey player who gets paid for n not for the National Hockey League. As long as you didn't play in the NHL, you had a decent chance of being able to play in international hike, ice hockey. The problem, of course, for the United States and Canada was it's their best players were all in the National Hockey League. Um, and, but also people like to overlook the fact that uh, the people playing in Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union were professional hockey players. They just weren't getting paid officially to be hockey players. They were army players or you know things of that nature. Absolutely, absolutely. So 1967, um, it's the World Championships and it's Czechoslovakia against the Soviet Union. And um, as you said earlier, Yaroslav doesn't like Soviets. <laughs> Yaroslav doesn't like Soviets. And most of all, he doesn't like a Soviet player by the name of Alexander Rogolin, who was a giant. He was a defenseman and was physically a giant. He, uh, he stood many inches taller than Yaroslav, at least 40 pounds on him. And the two of them went at it throughout this 1967 world championships. And, and one of the great joys I had in preparing the research for this book was w watching these games. I, I, you know, I got plenty of footage of these old games. And so I'd read about these games where, you know, the people talked about, oh, it got tough between Yaroslav and the Soviet players. And Yaroslav was doing things to the Soviets to tick them off. I had no idea until I watched the footage. The footage just blew my mind. I mean, Yaroslav was taking his stick and poking Soviets whenever he had the chance. 
uh, Rogolin was picking uh, Yaroslav up in the air and slamming him down to the ice. At one point, Rogolin holds up Yaroslav against the boards until one uh, an, a Soviet teammate can come flying in and smash into Yaroslav. It really is this violent, and which was really unusual for international ice hockey. International ice hockey wasn't that violent, typically. And so thanks to Yaroslav, this game got really, really violent. And near the end of the game, the, the, the Soviets were winning fairly handily. And the Holik brothers start getting into it with Soviets. And next thing you know, a full all-out brawl takes place. It, and as I said, watch it, I had read about the brawl and seeing it as a whole nother story. It is a full-scale brawl. And so where all these guys are fighting each other and... But they both teams ordinarily in ice hockey, you have five skaters on the ice for each team. Um, but the end of the game, they had kicked so many players out that they only were uh, permitted to have three skaters per team. And what was most incredible, so the Soviets easily won the match, which left Czechoslovakia extremely uh, unhappy because they had thought, oh, we're we're ready to challenge these guys. But this was um, the tournament was in Vienna. And in 1967, there had been a little bit of loosening up in Czechoslovakia where uh, there had been some travel being permitted for Czechs and Slovaks. So there are a lot of Czechs and Slovaks in the stands and they start cursing the Soviets with just simply with abandon. And at the end of international ice hockey matches, you play the national anthem of the winning team and you couldn't hear the national anthem because of all the whistling coming down from the Czech and Slovak fans. And in fact, when the, uh, the head of the Ice Hockey Federation wants to present the trophy, you can barely hear him because there is so much whistling and screaming. And growing out of this, there, the, the Soviets and the communist leaders of Czechoslovakia became really concerned that this ice hockey match had actually raised tensions between the two countries. And the um, ambassador from the Soviet Union to Czechoslovakia actually recommended just a couple days after the match, we shouldn't allow any sort of sport that involves con you know, actual you know, physical conflict um, where people are hitting each other on Czechoslovak soil, because this could lead to real, even greater problems between our countries. Wow. Wow. And this is just on the cusp before the Prague spring, isn't it? So Novotny is still in power at this point. Exactly. So Novotny is still in power, but this you can you can tell this is now leading to something a little different. I mean the fact that you were you were seeing people being able to travel outside of Czechoslovakia, something was different. And so uh about 9 months after this hockey match uh was held, that's when we really see the beginning of the Prague Spring with Alexander Dubček coming into power. And uh, you start seeing Czechoslovakia opening up in ways that had been previously unimaginable. And I should actually add one other piece to this. Um, one more way in which hockey was really important in all of this is Czechs and Slovaks looked at the, um, the play between the Soviets and Czechoslovakia and saw, I mean, they couldn't help but miss this, that the Soviets always won. Uh, in fact, the, in, in major international play, the only time Czechoslovakia had ever beaten the Soviets going into 1968, the only time Czechoslovakia had won was 1961. Other than that, the Soviets had always won. And people in Czechoslovakia had gotten sort of tired of the propaganda, the notion that, you know, we, we may be good, but the Soviets are always better than us in every way. They constantly heard this in their lives and they began to think and I, I spoke to people who who remember this. In fact, they still think that uh, Czechoslovakia wasn't a, wasn't allowed to win in ice hockey matches. They were not permitted to win. Now, the ice also spoke to a number of the players from the time who were mortified by this notion, the idea that somehow they would ever intentionally lose a match. But people, you know, your your regular Czechs and Slovaks thought they weren't allowed. It was, so this is an important, this is really an important point because it's suggesting we don't even have the freedom to, to carry out our athletics in, you know, a full scale heartfelt way. 
And so with the Prague Spring, people really started to wonder, if we're getting these freedoms, does that mean we are now permitted to beat the Soviets in ice hockey? That became something people talked about. Right. And and with the Prague Spring, you talk about the freedoms. I mean, there was a, a lifting of censorship. So, you know, newspapers were able to publish relatively freely, radio and TV, uh, people could travel abroad. I mean, it was a dramatic change in how people imagined a communist country to be, because it was still a communist country. It wasn't as though they'd thrown off the ideology. Dubček, who was the Czechoslovak leader at the time, I think that his policies were described as socialism with a human face. This is actually something that uh, people who don't study the area frequently miss. It's not that they were screaming for a new democratic capitalist state. Exactly right. What they were, in fact, if anything, there was overwhelming support for maintenance of the communist system, but to do so in uh, an inoppressive way, to stop holding the people down in ways that they had in the past, to I mean, to to allow people to speak freely. And the idea was that if we do this, in fact, what we've done, th this is the notion that Dupchek had is, look, we're actually reaching a higher level of socialism, one that we have we have now achieved our primary goals. So now we can uh, take off uh, the shackles a bit and allow people to enjoy all the fruits of our socialist society while also giving them greater freedoms. That's exactly that was the idea behind uh the, the socialism with the human face. And Yuji is a member of the Communist Party at this time as well. Yeah, so this is such an interesting one. Um, so most of the people who were on the army teams permanently, so it's, uh, some, you know, everybody, everybody in the country had to go serve uh, for a couple of years with the army, but very few people would actually stick with the army afterwards. Well, Yuji and Yaroslav and, and a, a group of others did stay around and they were some of the best players in the country. And almost every single person on the army team who would stick around would become a member of the Communist Party because, I mean, one, they were getting all this pressure uh, from their superiors to do so. But also there was a sense of, look, if you're not a member of the Communist Party, you can be punished by the government. Uh, you won't get all the benefits and certainly things like your children won't be able to get into decent schools. And... Yuji just was getting pummeled with, you need to join the party, you need to join the party, you need to join the party. And he was, you know, somebody who always avoided conflict. And at a certain point, he just, he just wanted to be rid of all the pressure he was under. So he decided, he agreed to join the party on the condition that he didn't have to attend any meetings. Uh, meanwhile, his brother said... If you are this, and one of the his brother Yaroslav's mantras in life is, "I'm going to become too good to be denied. As long as you are good at hockey, nothing can happen to you. So I'm good at hockey, so I don't have to join the party, and I can get by with what I want." Jan Suki just didn't care. He just sat there, and people would come. Jan Suki, I, I didn't say enough about him earlier. By the way, this guy was such a character. I mean, just a really delightful figure, um, but also you know, um, pushed his body to some pretty crazy limits. He's a kid who started smoking at 11 and started hard drinking at 13. So he was this, this wild young man, um, but he was also this incredible athlete. Well, because he was such an incredible athlete, he could get away with things that other people couldn't. S s things such as pouring ice down referees' pants during a game. Um, he would get in airplanes with his teammates. The, the Holy Brothers hated flying. They found flying in airplanes terrifying. And Suki would go up to the pilot and convince him to go into a steep descent suddenly and terrify all his teammates. He thought that was hilarious. So this is the kind of guy he was. And he just said when people tried to pressure him to join the Communist Party, he said, "If look, I'm not going to join the Communist Party. And if you don't like it, you can throw me off the team. And he was so good that nobody would ever dream of doing that. We move on to February 1968. It's the early months of the of the Prague Spring. In Grenoble, they've got the World Ice Hockey Championships and the Olympics being played together. And guess what? The Czechs are going to play the Soviets again. It's incredible. It's it's really incredible. Uh, 
So remember, I had said before that people didn't think Czechoslovakia was permitted to win against the Soviets in ice hockey. And now we've got the Prague Spring and people are wondering, does this mean we're finally allowed to win? And one of the things, uh, so I, I've, I've read about a lot of sports over the years. It's, it's amazing how infrequently the, uh, the important sporting matchups are, end up being rather dull affairs. You know, everybody's excited going in. I feel like nine out of the 10 big matchups in this book, nine out of 10 of them are thrilling games. The 1968 Olympics are incredible, where the Soviets and Czechoslovakia are going head to head, and it looks like the winner of the game will probably win the Olympic gold medal. And an important thing, Czechoslovakia had never won an Olympic gold medal in ice hockey, which is a big deal given they had a long history of being very successful in the sport. And one of the things that I find most delightful about this story is there was uh, there's an incredible coach for Czechoslovakia, uh, Jaroslav Pitner, um, who, along with uh, a gentleman who is known as the ice hockey professor, uh, Vladimir Kostka, uh, were coaching the Czechoslovak team. And they came up with an idea that they knew the Soviets didn't, basically, they didn't have a proper buffer on their skates. In other words, their skates could actually harm somebody. And so right before game time, they sprung it on the referees that the Soviets were not properly attired. And so the Soviets now have to go off and suddenly fix all their ice skates and it kind of throws them off. And so early in the match, Czechoslovakia has a big lead and is doing extremely well. Well, of it, the match continues to go on. Czechoslovakia continues to build on its lead. And the captain of the team at one point celebrates a goal. This is a, the captain of the team uh, was Josef Golonka, who was again. I, I, I'm so I feel so thrilled that this the story I have is filled with all these colorful characters. And Golonka was one of the most colorful of all. He loved to uh, act like a wild man on the ice. He would uh, collapse uh, onto the ice, pretending he'd been stabbed at points just to entertain the crowd. And in this moment, when it seemed like Czechoslovakia had the match won, Golonka had this wild celebration where he lies down on the ice. He looks, he looks sort of like a clapping um, seal at one point. And there was this picture of him lying on the ice that um, the picture was seen throughout the European papers over the next couple of days. And what the caption um, that accompanied the picture said was, Golonka putting his ear to the ice to listen if the Soviets have cut off the natural gas and oil going to Czechoslovakia. I mean, there was this real sense that this is actually potentially political. The Soviets could be so mad at us that they are going to cut off our resources. How does the, uh, the Grenoble match against the Soviets play out? So it really seems like Czechoslovakia has the match won and the Soviets come back with a fury. And they are pushing. So, so the the so, uh, Czechoslovakia is up by a number of goals, and the Soviets are great. And Czechoslovakia got a little distracted, and the Soviets are pushing, and they get within a goal to make it four for Soviets, five for Czechoslovakia, and that is ultimately how the match ends with Czechoslovakia winning wow. five to four. And and back in throughout the country, people are chalking that number anywhere they can find. They're just writing 5-4 to really denote what had happened. And people thought about that for a while. Now, we're now moving forward to August in Czechoslovakia. And Alexander Dubček is under enormous pressure from the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries to roll back these reforms. The Warsaw Pact are worried that their own populations are going to demand similar freedoms and on August the 20th, 1968, the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact decide they've had enough and tanks roll in to Czechoslovakia. So where are the Holik boys when the invasion begins? The army club was off in West Germany at the time of the invasion. And uh, a part of my story involves um, the the Holik families, and Yaroslav's wife is back in Czechoslovakia, and she finds their tanks in the streets of Czechoslovakia, 
And she's obviously miserable over that, but she's also terrified of what is going to happen to my husband. Yaroslav was not only somebody who fought with everybody and screamed at all his teammates and uh, those he played against, but he was also utterly outspoken when it came to his feeling, his negative feelings about the communists and towards the Soviets. And so she was really concerned. Yaroslav's wife was really worried that he was going to get back into Czechoslovakia and somebody was going to arrest him for his past behavior. So she was, you know, trying to figure out clever ways to get information to him. But yes, meanwhile, the the army men, they couldn't communicate with their families back in Czechoslovakia. And they were hearing these horrible stories about what was happening, but only in partial bits. And all they could tell was there are tanks everywhere. They're shooting. What is happening to our people? It was terrifying for them. Dubček is dragged off to Moscow to negotiate in speech marks with with the Soviets. And he is uh, forced to sign something called the Moscow Protocol. So this is about six days after the invasion. And the idea of this is to bring Czechoslovakia back to the hardline communist state form it was in before the Prague Spring. And so 27th of August, he returns home, delivers a speech, but it's obvious that he's upset and that he is extremely tired by the negotiations. This is... uh, I, I... I found this story just, it, it, it made my eyes a little wet reading you know, when I read about it for the first time. It was really a, a, an incredibly tragic moment. This man, I mean, first of all, he was exhausted. He had barely slept for days. He was, uh, there was nervous exhaustion. Um, he was not, uh, his body was falling apart. And he had felt like his world, he had create. he had helped Czechoslovakia reach a new level, something that he had really dreamed of achieving for his people. And he knew full well now that everything was going to go back to how it was before. He, he hoped he could figure out a way to keep it from going fully back to the oppressive times from before. But he had a pretty good sense that things were going back pretty sharply. So he goes on the radio and he delivers this speech in which that's right. He periodically, he, he kept pausing And it became difficult to understand what he was saying because sobs would get stuck in his throat. And so people at home were listening, people at home in Czechoslovakia were listening to their leader explain to them how difficult this was all going to be, how painful this all was. And they had, you know, the Czechs and Slovaks had been in the streets up to this point, you know, peacefully resisting the invaders. And what Dubček asked them to do was get out of the streets. The only way we can even have a hope of maintaining some of our reforms is to engage in a word that the Soviets pushed, engage in normalization. Nobody explained what that meant exactly at the time, but what normalization really meant was do what the Soviets say and go back to the more oppressive type of life we had before. But as a result of this speech, that Dubček gave, people willingly stopped resisting, and which was uh, which really ultimately kind of broke the hearts of people throughout the country. There were isolated protests, and one of the most memorable ones, and I learned about this a few years back, and I found it really powerful looking at the footage of this, is uh, Vera Kaslavska, the uh, Czechoslovak gymnast. Oh. That is right. This is uh, an incredible story where, uh, so I, we spoke earlier about Emil Zadopek, the great uh, runner and hero around the world in track. Vera Chaslavska was the most popular woman in Czechoslovakia. So in nine, and, and I should say, add, she was a gymnast. And in 1964 at the Tokyo Olympics, uh, Vera Chaslavska had been that had been overwhelmingly the greatest gymnast at the event. Uh, she won the all-around women's title, and by 1968, she was the clear greatest uh, female gymnast in the world. I mean, she she was. I mean, today in recent years, Simone Bi- we've had Simone Biles. Vera Choslovska was the Simone Biles of the 1960s. So, uh, Vera Choslovska 
was not only a great gymnast and still competing in 1968, she also was outspokenly in support of the reforms. Uh, she had signed an open manifesto in support of the reforms uh, prior to the invasion, and she was worried when the invasion occurred that she was actually going to be arrested. So she actually went into hiding uh, in the mountains and did and trained for gymnastics out in a meadow and on tree limbs. It's uh, you know just a, a really remarkable image. Uh, but when she learned that she wasn't going to, be, going to be arrested and was going to be permitted to go to the Mexico City 1968 Summer Olympics, you know, she left the mountains and she flew off to Mexico City and she had a spectacular Olympics. And she uh, overwhelmingly won the all-around title, and she won a number of gold medals. The, there were two events, however, where Soviets were also won gold medals in women's gymnastics. And in each case, Chaslovska was on the medal podium with the Soviet gymnasts. And when they played the Soviet anthem to celebrate the gold medal for these two uh, f uh, Soviet female athletes, Chaslovska very clearly turned her head away from the Soviet uh, flag. I mean, she was very clearly making a protest on the medal podium, which really stood out because just about a week earlier, uh, two Americans, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, had carried out their uh, fist in the air protests in track and had gotten into huge amounts of trouble. And in Chaslovska's case, people scarcely noticed it. Except back in Czechoslovakia, people really talked about how she had really stood up for uh, the people of Czechoslovakia and really tried to you know, make a statement about how upset they were about what the Soviets had done. And I'll try and find the footage of that and put that in the uh, episode notes because it's, it's, it's well worth seeing. So by December 68, there's further pressure on Dubček. He's still the leader of the country, but his allies, some of the, his fellow reformers have been removed from government. And as we move into 1969, there's a particular tragedy on January the 16th, 1969 in Wenceslas Square. That's right. A, a young man, a 20-year-old college student named Jan Polk, uh, walks to Wenceslas Square and takes out a pair of bottles that are labeled ether and seemingly out of nowhere he pours the contents of the two bottles all over himself and then lights himself on fire and it was one of these moments that really shook the people of the country um it's it, you, you, we periodically hear stories about self-immolation um, but this is one of the most famous examples um, that the world has ever known. And it was a statement. One of the things that was interesting about this statement, he was protesting the Soviets' invasion, to be sure. That was part of the point of him uh, setting himself on fire. But an equally, if not more important piece of it to Pollock was that he felt that the people of Czechoslovakia had given up that they'd become demoralized. And so he had a note, a letter with him um, that explained that he did not want his martyrdom because he did, in fact, ultimately die. Um, he didn't want his martyrdom to be in vain, that the purpose of him lighting himself on fire was to remind the people, look, we don't have to be like this. We don't have to passively just give in to what the Soviets are doing to us. And very briefly, this um, his own death led to many more protests throughout the country, people actually pushing back mu much more harshly against the new normalization that was coming in and pushing back against the Soviet presence. And then instantly, the Soviets made sure that the new, more hardline group that was now governing along with Dubček really crushed things, pushed things down much harder against the protests that were emerging following Pollock's death. The ice hockey players, the Holik family and uh, the rest of the team are enraged, but they're, they're limited as to what they can do. However, the 1969 World Ice Hockey Championships beckon. They were due to be held in Prague, but uh, the the Czechoslovak government decide perhaps that isn't perhaps a good idea. <laughs> yeah. um, and it and it's held in um, 
Stockholm. And uh, whilst the players are on a bus to the airport, uh, they hand the Czech Ice Hockey Federation a uh, statement. Even before this this statement, before they made this statement, they they had actually had to bring in a sports psychologist to the team because the team wanted to fight. They they actually wanted to get on the ice and just start fighting the Soviet players when they got to the ice hockey championships. They they didn't even want to go <laughs> carry out the pleasantries of a hockey match. They simply wanted to fight. Finally, the the, the combination of the sports psychologist working with them and people coming to them and saying, we don't care what else you do in this tournament. You just, they, they called them the Russians, just beat the Russians. Well, a required practice at the end of all international ice hockey matches is each team, all the players on each team have to shake hands with one another. And the players got on the bus getting ready to take off to go to Stockholm, Sweden, and they pulled out a letter they had all signed saying, we will not shake hands with the Soviets, which sent the bureaucrats uh, aligned with the team into a tizzy, having to go find out how they, you know, from their authorities, how do we handle this? And eventually they just, they they knew they couldn't replace the whole team at this point and finally just agreed to let them go, but just really prayed things wouldn't get too out of hand. So the tournament starts on March the 15th, 1969. How did the uh, Czechoslovak team initially fare? So the Czechoslovakia came out playing quite well although uh, they lost an early match to Sweden. And the immediate sense was, uh, look, part of our problem right now is we're not fully, our attention isn't fully here. We're looking ahead to things. So they, in their initial matches, they, they won a group of them, but then lost to the Swedes. Now, the, 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 the reason that they were distracted is they were about to face an incredibly good uh, Soviet team that was coming in uh, probably its greatest team it had ever put together at that point. And they were really focused on the Sofia team that was obliterating every team it had played. So the Czechoslovak team face the Soviets on March the, the 21st. Can you try and describe the atmosphere in the build-up to that game, if it's possible to oh. describe it? This was... this. I, th- I mean, that's part of the thing is this is just truly, uh, this is just su- such a wonderful, wonderful moment for people who just simply want drama. So uh, this had been something, Czechoslovakia, the people, I mean, this is part of the thing is when you try and describe this is it's it's almost as if the air in Stockholm was was traveling to Czechoslovakia and back. It was almost like the people of Czechoslovakia and the Czechoslovak players, and in fact, even the Swedish fans were all sharing the same air in this moment. So uh, prior to the match, you had the Czechoslovak players riding the bus, focused in a way they had never been focused on a sporting event in their life. They just kept thinking to themselves, you know, this is for our people. Our people have no other way to fight back. They are powerless. And in fact, our people think that they're not permitted to do anything. All their freedoms are being taken away. And by the way, just a a quick aside on this. um, One of the the joys of of preparing for this book, um, doing the research, was I interviewed uh, Martina Navratilova, the, the Czechoslovak tennis legend. And... The reason Martina was interested in talking to me about this was because I wasn't asking her about her tennis career. I was asking her about her experience watching these hockey matches because she was a kid at the time of these matches. And she was in her little apartment with her family watching their little tiny black and white television, watching every second, just, you know, trying to do anything she could with her own you know, body language to help the team. And she told me about these matches. And this is where the title of my book comes. This is why I, I bring it in. She told me the hockey games went beyond sports. They gave people hope. And the outcome of those matches would let us know if we still had the freedom to win. So the, the title of the book comes from Martina Navratilova talking about you know, what did we have anything? Did we have any freedom left? Perhaps these hockey matches would show us if we did. Okay, so that's kind of that's that's the feeling of people in Czechoslovakia as they prepare for these. And the players were so aware of this. 
And so the players then skate out to the ice to look around. And by the way, I should add, they played twice against the Soviets in this tournament. Each team played every other team twice in the tournament. So March 21st, this was the first match between the Soviets and Czechoslovakia. And the players come out to the ice, the Czechoslovak players, and the crowd, which is mostly Swedish, is starts cheering for the, the Czechoslovak players as if they were the, the home team. And they're holding up signs written in Czech. Things, uh, and one of the, I, I found the most powerful sign to be, you send tanks, we bring goals. Meaning, okay, Soviets, you're so tough with your tanks, but we're going to fight back with you on the ice. Meanwhile, the Soviets come out and the crowd starts whistling and jeering the Soviet players. And so there's this intensity to the whole thing that um, I, I really, I, I cannot recall ever having seen, you know, again, I watched the footage of this and, and especially I was especially attuned to the sounds. And this did not sound like a match between, this was in Stockholm, between two teams, neither of which came from the country in which it was being played. So were they showing this live in Czechoslovakia. I mean, I would imagine if I was the Czech government, I'd have it on some sort of time delay in case there's some protest or some huge puncture. <laughs> that's I mean, that's a good question, actually. I mean, of course, of course, that's what would happen today. I don't know if they were able to do a, a tape delay kind of thing back then or not. I have I have no idea. It's possible. Um, they were showing it live, but there were a couple things. Uh, there were a couple important points. Um, one is. Um, there were strict orders not to send home um, close-up footage of the stands. So you, periodically, there would be the, the the camera would look up at the stands, but very quickly. So people back in Czechoslovakia weren't getting a really strong look at the signs being held up. Um, but the only other piece of censorship um, that was an important one was, you know, you you uh, brought up earlier how the Czechoslovak players had said, we will not shake hands with the Soviets at the end of the match. And in fact, they 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 stuck with that. They did not shake hands with the Soviets at the end of the match, which the Western press had a field day with completely you know, pointing out the they did not shake hands. However, before that happened, before the handshake could occur, the feed was cut. Now, I don't know if that was intentional by the uh, Czechoslovak authorities or not, but nobody ever saw back in Czechoslovakia the, the, the players refusing to shake hands with the Soviets. I'm presuming, you know, this was a physical match again between these two teams. This was such a physical match. I mean, even players who usually didn't get terribly physical um, were... Um, making a point of hitting the Soviets incredibly hard. Um, now, there was also a, a point that was um, not physical, that was kind of, that was funny. Um, Team Czechoslovakia had decided that one of its best ways of throwing off the Soviets was to delay a lot, to not let the Soviets get into rhythm. And so any moment they could to uh, extend um, periods in which there was no play, longer and longer to get the Soviets sort of antsy. And before the match, uh, when the, the referees tried to get everybody you know, settled to play, the Czechoslovak players just wouldn't leave the ice. They just kept skating around and around and around, um, just trying to hold off and get the Soviets uncomfortable. Okay, so that we had a lot of that going on. But when there was play, the Czechoslovak players were hitting the Soviets hard in a way that was really unusual, even you know by any sort of standard where the two teams had played before. And um, so the the Soviet players were shocked by this. They weren't used to this physical kinds of behavior, and they were even a little surprised by just how angry the Czechoslovak players were and the intensity of the crowd. Um, but of course, the person who was in the middle of some of the most intense um, physical confrontations was Yaroslav Holik. And um, one of the moments I find uh, both funny and terrifying was at one point, the Soviet goaltender came way out um, from the net and was preparing to, he got control of the puck and was preparing to pass it. And he passed it off. And a split second later, Yaroslav had made a point of skating from as far away on the ice as possible and launched himself like a missile to deck the Soviet 
um, goaltender onto the ground, onto the ice. It was something, you know, it, hockey goalies rarely get hit like that. It was really this powerful moment. But I, I actually, the, the most powerful moment in the match was involved the first goal being scored, um, where the um, part of the, the starring unit for Czechoslovakia had uh, Yaroslav Holik and his brother Yiji and Jan Suki, the the three the three boys who come from the small town, and they I mean th this is sort of an indication of what uh, national heroes they were that they were on the ice in this this pivotal moment where they were trying to score the first goal of the match. the The score was tied up at zero midway through the second period, and Yaroslav plays in this incredibly physical fashion right near the goalie and managed to uh, to knock over a defenseman, which knocks over the the goalie and Jan Suki scores a goal to send uh, Czechoslovakia up one nothing. Now, uh, uh, a few months ago, actually about a year ago, I think it was, you had Vashi Nedomansky talking about his father, uh, Big Ned. Yeah, episode 132, and I'll be linking to that in the episode notes. And it's such a good one. It's a great episode. Well, right after Suhi scores this goal to send Czechoslovakia up one nothing. Uh, and back in Czechoslovakia, there's a there's a famous actor who threw open his windows and yelled out goal. And he looks outside and realizes there's nobody in the streets because everybody is at home watching. In fact, they, they've got statistics, something like 93 percent of all households were watching the, the match. Well, right after the goal scores, Big Ned, Vashi's father, Václav Nedomansky, goes over to the right side of the net and lifts it up, takes it off its moorings, you know, in a, in a fit of passion. Yaroslav, meanwhile, is standing right in front of the goalie with his hockey stick and takes it, shakes it within an inch of the hockey, the Soviet goalie's face, screaming, you bleeping commie. And then Yaroslav takes his stick and starts smashing it on top of the net and lifts the left side of the net up and throws the entire net some 20 feet away from where they are. It was a stunning moment. I mean, this is George Orwell once wrote that serious sport is war minus the shooting. This is one of the clearest examples I have ever seen of that description. This sounds pretty close to the shooting, though, as well. I mean, the, the levels of, of violence going on here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So how does this match play out? So this match plays out with a 2 nothing victory, um, where the players, again, escape without shaking hands. And then there is a week later, a second match, which is, if anything, even more intense than the first. In the lead up to match two, people were wondering, you know, would, would Czechoslovakia still have something left over? Um, and in fact, something uh, sort of tragic befalls the team where Jan Suhi, who was the best player on the team, ends up breaking his finger and can't even play in game two. And so there's some concern, how is this going to affect the team? Well, as that's going on, Yaroslav Holik and a group of players on Czechoslovakia's team decide that it's not enough merely to um, withhold a handshake from the Soviets, but that they need to take things even farther to, to show just how upset they are with the Soviets and what the Soviets represent. And so Czechoslovakia at the time had on uh, the Czechoslovak hockey players had the uh, Czechoslovak uh, coat of arms on the cover on the front of their jerseys. And the coat of arms had a communist star on it. And so Yaroslav and a group of his teammates take black tape and tape over the communist star. And so they take the ice against the Soviets for game two on March 28th with this, this, uh, well, taping over the symbol of communism and showing their derision for their opponent and especially for the Soviet Union. So the match is, if anything, more intense than the first one between the two teams and turns out with a very narrow Czechoslovak victory. Back in Czechoslovakia, you get a response, a reaction to 
a hockey match that is unusual even by the standards of countries where they live for their sporting teams. Um, at first, it's a celebration. Uh, you have something like 150,000 people going to Wenceslas Square. Um, there, there, you can find pictures of the traffic jams around Wenceslas Square. It's, I mean, it's difficult to move around. People are celebrating wildly. And there's clearly a political element to the whole thing. So the score of the second match was four to three. So four for Czechoslovakia. And so you had people carrying around signs that say Duke Czech four, Brezhnev three. So there's this clear, it's not just a hockey match here. This is representing something more. But fairly soon, and, and you have these celebrants all around the country, and it's, we're talking well over half a million people in a country of just about 15 million people. Over half a million people are taking to the streets celebrating. Before long, though, they aren't just celebrating. You have especially what you have, you have riots in the towns uh, where Soviet troops are, are based. And you have people uh, throwing bricks at Soviet barracks. And the most serious case uh, was the Aeroflot uh, office in Wenceslas Square in Prague, where people come and destroy these. It, so Aeroflot being the Soviet airline in um, Prague. And some people, uh, many Czechs and Slovaks will go to their grave insisting that this was actually a plot by the secret police in Czechoslovakia, that this was not sincere, that this, these were not actually people angry, but they were people who were, it was a false flag operation, trying to show that the protesters were going too far. I, I am yet to see really good evidence for that. I'm not dismissing it entirely. I just haven't seen good evidence for that. Um, but whatever the case, uh, there is serious damage done to the Aeroflot office, and eventually, um, you've got security forces who have to come out and quell all the violence. And this ultimately became referred to as the hockey riots. And the hockey riots were, this was, the hockey riots had a massive impact on Czechoslovakia. The Soviets instantly uh, decried what had happened and sent over two leading diplomats to speak to the Czechoslovak leadership about you need to change things immediately. And this led to a massive crackdown. It, it, was, it was sort of the last gasp. It was a massive crackdown on Czechoslovak resistance and ultimately, uh, very soon, led to Dubček getting fired and ultimately being forced out of the country for some time. Yeah, that's right. He's sort of made, I think, ambassador to Turkey. And then after that, he ends up being made a forestry official in some desolate part of Czechoslovakia. Exactly. And 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 by the way, Dubček himself highlighted something that um I I hadn't I hadn't really realized. He when he was sent off to Turkey, he thought back to I'm pretty sure Leon Trotsky was sent there as well at one point. So he sort of saw himself in the line of in a long line of people who had gotten on the wrong side of of the the top yeah. dog. He was so, lucky yeah. not to end up with an ice pick, I guess, in his in his hand. Exactly. I think he was lucky to survive, to be honest. He was. No, he was. In fact, he thought that if it hadn't been for the incredible um, support and resistance in the streets of Czechoslovakia, the people specifically calling for him to be brought home when he'd been kidnapped to the Moscow. His view was he would have been killed if it weren't for them. What are the consequences for these players when they get back, particularly the ones who've had black tape on their shirts? And first, actually, the 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 leadership didn't come down immediately on the players. So normalization was a little bit slow to kick in. In part, it took a little while to wind its way through the bureaucracy, where it, people weren't quite sure what what should we what should we crack down on first? It takes a little while to to do all that. Um, fairly quickly, though, journalists were getting hit. And so um anything that was even slightly construed by, say, for example, one one of the announcers had some, said something pretty innocuous about just encouraging the people to celebrate. And he was accused of trying to incite a riot. And so he lost his position and wasn't permitted to broadcast hockey anymore. The same thing happened to uh, a newscaster at home. Many reporters faced the same sort of thing. 
it took a little while to hit the players, but soon um, one player by the name of Jan Havel, uh, no relation, um, found himself removed from the national team. And then Yaroslav Holik, uh, about a year later, found himself removed from the national team. Um, seemingly, the question was, you know, would he ever be back again at the time? Uh, it, it, it seemed like he may, may never be uh, permitted back on. But because of his actions, um, he was specifically putting the tape on his uh, jersey. He was removed from the national team. Right. And was that the only sanction against him? That really was the primary sanction against him. Otherwise, he didn't have anything too serious. I mean, this again, this sort of points to, aside from 1950, when the national team was imprisoned, for the most part, the, the communists really didn't like doing too much to their athletes. They were too valuable to them. And Holik was a national hero. So uh, that, that was really basically it for what hit him at the time. And what was the rest of their careers like? Because, I mean, this is sort of 1970 now. So it's, you know, still 20 years before the Velvet Revolution. So there's 20 years of normalization. What, what happens during that period with them? Uh, Yaroslav Holik got removed from the national team. It was for a very short period, however. Um, by 1972, some players had gotten hurt. And so he, uh, Yaroslav had missed 1971, I believe it was. And in 1972, however, players had uh, found th th the team needed Yaroslav, <laughs> essentially. And so they brought him back in and he continued to be a star for a couple of years. Um, Yaroslav... Had, the key thing here, too, is Yaroslav was removed from the national team, but he was never removed from his army team. He was always permitted to still be there. This was more about representing the country. Um, so Yaroslav continued to be on the national team and, and played a really big part in an incredible decade where Czechoslovakia was a great hockey team and really, truly challenged the Soviets in the 1970s. Yizhi, meanwhile, became uh, an even greater star than before and became uh, a consistently among the top, uh, voted consistently among the top five or so players in the country and became one of the great elder statesmen of the, the, team, the Czechoslovakia's national team. Jan Suhi was a different story, however. He um, was the clear best player um, in Czechoslovakia in 1969 and 1970, just a, a remarkable all-around player, which he did all while also... <laughs> drinking and smoking to extraordinary excess. It was it, that in itself is is sort of a, a superpower that he was able to push beyond what he was uh, forcing his body to endure. However, uh, again, because these these stories can never be simple um, and and they end up being very dramatic. He was involved. He was the driver in a, a horrible accident in which he'd been drinking a little bit um, where a passenger got killed. And as a result of that, he found him res himself removed from the national team precisely at the moment where Czechoslovakia was looking like it could challenge the Soviet Union on the ice. And he found himself to be um, blackballed to some degree by the national government. He was never given uh, the prominence that he had held before, even though he continued to play world class hockey. In those games against the Soviet Union after the, uh, you know, the infamous Stockholm um, two matches, did uh, Yaroslav still play against the Soviets with, let's say, the same intensity? Nothing in the world could ever halt Yaroslav Holik from throwing his body and emotions. Nothing would ever change this man. If anything, he got more intense over the years. So he was never doing anything quite like using black tape to tape over communist stars, but he continued to push with the same intensity as ever. Yes. With the Velvet Revolution, did any of them move to play in other leagues or were they too old at that point really to uh, play international? So by 1989, so these, so Yaroslav was born in 1942 and Yiji and Jan had both been born in 44. So by this point, they're in their 40s. So they were too old to head west um, and play in the NHL. But one of the parts of this story that I, I, I it's just, this is the story that just keeps giving more stories. This was one of the reasons why I, I never, 
I, I didn't want to end the book at, at right after the 1969 events uh, was Yaroslav Holik was not just a wild man on the ice or a wild man uh, with people um, who were friends or he would just run into on the street. He was also a wild man with his children. And he had two children, uh, a boy and a girl. And before they were born, he had decided that they would both be world-class athletes. And he trained them as if their lives depended upon them becoming great. And so he had a daughter, Andrea, who uh, went on to become one of the world's great female tennis players and went to star for uh, Czechoslovakia's national tennis team. And he had a son, Bobby, who was simply great. And Bobby ultimately went on to play for the National Hockey League once, uh, once communism fell. Now, the Velvet Revolution comes and the uh, overthrow of, of communism in, in Czechoslovakia. And probably the, the most powerful and, and moving moment of that period is the reappearance of Alexander Dubček after so long he appears on a balcony in Prague. It just uh, what an event. Uh, I mean, this is, this is, again, one of these moments you can actually find on YouTube. It, it's, it's extraordinary. So there is this moment. I mean, people in Prague had not seen, in fact, nobody had seen Dubček speaking in public until just a couple days before in Bratislava, uh, in the Slovak part of the country. And Dubček had gotten uh, immediately, it found transit to Prague where all the excitement was happening in November 1989. And there became a sense among the crowd in Wenceslas Square that Dubček might be here. He might actually be here. And this is with some, you know, a, a quarter of a million, a third of a million people standing in the streets underneath this balcony chanting and they are chanting the name Dupček over and over um, because they think he might be there and then all of a sudden he appears and there's ex an extraordinary roar and he's a little I think he's a little taken aback by the moment because he had his reading glasses on he was getting ready to read and as he gets this uh, incredible cheer, he thrusts his reading glasses into the air and then starts pantomiming, embracing the crowd that then continues to chant his name over and over again. And by the way, tying this back to the sports again, I mean, something that I loved, I, I, I left this out earlier, in these two hockey matches against the Soviet Union, again, this is the mark that this is not just a sporting event. During these hockey matches against the Soviet Union in 1969 in Stockholm, so in Sweden, at the end of the matches, the entire crowd starts chanting Dupček, Dupček over and over again. They knew what this was about. And so he gets the same sort of adulation in Prague, except with something like 20 times the number of people in 1989. The book is called Freedom to Win, a Cold War story of the courageous hockey team that fought the Soviets for the soul of its people and Olympic gold. The author is Ethan Shiner. It's published by Pegasus Books. You can purchase the book via the link in the episode information. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.